380 miles from the equator, there's a place visited by few, but cherished by many. A place where the population is estimated at more than 25 million. A place where the official language is English, but there still remain 70 other dialects and languages constantly used amongst the natives. A country that gained its independence from the British in March of 1957. A country located in West Africa, whose name translates to Warrior King. A country that Kwame Nkrumah became the first prime minister of in 1951, when it was still known as the Gold Coast. That destination is Ghana. Born in the same year that Ghana received its independence, 58-year-old Peter Rowell is a man with a unique story. I was born in the year 1957 to a mother, Miss Mary Rowell, and a dad uh, who I grew up to know was a British from Scotland, but I didn't get to know, know him. I was a child and then, well, the man left. Peter was raised by a single parent and finished his last year of schooling in 1983. This was a Greek school that honed in on agricultural science. Upon completion, Peter began farming and has been doing so ever since. In 2015, Peter had a dangerous encounter on the road that nearly changed the course of his life forever. I was riding a motorbike, uh, helping me on my farm. Some bigger trucks were ahead of me. No car was coming, so I sped up. All of a sudden a car was coming from the right to go to Takoradi and I thought it was going to stop. This caused Peter to quickly panic, leaving him with no other option except to prepare for impact. All I heard was a big bang. Where I hit the car I didn't see. It was like I had been lifted somewhere and then hit some, to some brick wall. Crowds gathered around Peter only to witness he had been seriously injured. Then a good Samaritan took him to a nearby hospital. Hey, so then, then I saw that both my legs were broken. Then I broke out in tears from that time. Aside from the 45,000 customary healers practicing throughout the country, the Ghana Health Service, or GHS, is the primary provider for health care and was established in 1996. The GHS acts as a separate entity from the central government, even though it is a publicly funded organization. This allows for a sharper focus on the logistics of running day-to-day -day operations at the hospitals, clinics, and health care centers across Ghana. For the first three nights at F.A. Quante Regional Hospital, Peter was suffering from excruciating pains and a running fever. It's like the place was like I was in an oven. Now the doctor visited me the next day. That's Dr. Prepra. And then, you know, expenditure started. Both my legs said, one, one leg was going to cost me 3,000 Ghana. So both 6,000. The National Health Insurance Scheme was adopted in Ghana between 2003 and 2005. It was implemented as a resource to help fund basic health care needs. But many Ghanaians do not take advantage of this service because it has been noted as poorly managed and not all medical services are covered. The doctor informed Peter that he needed surgery on both of his legs. His first surgery took place on the 11th of March, 2015, and the second took place a week later. Even the way they will lift you, I could hear my bones screeching together within my body. In fact, I was even wailing and weeping like I had, I had an accident at that very moment. Due to the surgeries and other medical expenses, Peter had exhausted all of his finances during a critical time of his rehabilitation. Left with only his wife to confide in, he received a pleasant surprise when an American nurse from Work the World took an interest in his story. I just heard a knock at the back of the ward window, that's ward D. Then I saw a nice, you know, gentleman, American, 
just standing at the back of the window and asked, what's happening? Oh, they asked my name. So I'm Peter Rowe. And I said, and you said Jordan. So when I asked, oh, River Jordan, then we were all smiling. Worked with Work the World, and they posted me at uh, Effie Aquanta Regional Hospital, where I got a, a lot of clinical uh, research, and I got to help a lot of people there, too. Jordan Miller is a licensed practical nurse from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. During his time at Effie Aquanta, he met Peter and his wife, Christina, while doing mission work at the regional hospital. Many Ghanaians in the rural and remote areas stay at least 15 kilometers from a doctor. That makes it extremely difficult to receive adequate medical attention. Peter's case was a unique situation because there was someone nearby to transport him to the hospital. This is Jordan's third visit to Ghana, and he believes that promoting international travel amongst his peers, especially to countries in Africa, can pose as a great learning experience for people from all walks of life. But the relationship between Peter and Jordan over just a span of two years has truly grown into something special. So that's what kind of brought me here, and then from there I fell in love with Ghana working with the people here. We had a conversation about what was going on and he told me that he got into a motor vehicle accident while riding his motorcycle. In Ghana, there's a lot of motor vehicle accidents, a lot. After Jordan's conversation with Peter about his condition, Jordan was eager to help him in any way he could. So I decided to just help out a little bit. Maybe I got him a wheelchair and some crutches and the gratitude I got from him was unexpected. I've gotten calls from him every other month since the incident last year. And God so good, look, lo and behold, Mr. Jordan came in with a brand new future. In fact, at the time, I felt in my heart that this man was God sent for a very particular moment of need in my life. Yes, I didn't know how to thank Mr. Jordan. Jordan's selfless contribution couldn't have come at a better time. Peter was previously in talks with a former patient from Kumasi about getting him a wheelchair and his wife was making some of the same efforts. And my wife was also going around Takradi town to search for a wheelchair. The person was trying to entice my wife with the promise of a wheelchair so that she could get my wife and use it for a spiritual sacrifice somewhere. It's typical in Ghana for hurt or sick patients to seek help from herbalists or spiritualists for medicine and health rituals. Oftentimes, these efforts are unsuccessful, but because of the current crippling health care system, people have no other option than to look for alternative means of being cured. Now, initially, when I sat on a new, the future, I couldn't sit for more than 30 minutes. I have to call the nurses, come and send me back to my bed, send me back because I was feeling some pains within my waist, within my legs. It wasn't until two months after both surgeries that Peter began to get comfortable with sitting in the wheelchair for long periods of time. He went from 30 minutes to a full two hours. Shortly after that, Peter's doctor informed him that he could be discharged. The medical staff had done all they could in administering the necessary medication, so the doctor instructed him to get some much-needed rest and to eat well once he returned home in order to continue the healing process. So for complete five months, I was in the future. So it was then after that I started forcing myself to, you know, use some improvised crutches, move some steps, about five steps, then I'll come back to my, my future. It wasn't until seven months after his motor vehicle accident that Peter was able to use his crutch and move outside of his home. Today, Peter is healthy and able to use both of his legs while only using one crutch for balance. Without the aid from the wheelchair, Peter's road to recovery might have experienced many more barriers. And in fact, the doctors even told me, you needed this badly. In fact, I did not been for that future. For now, I wouldn't be able to, you know, walk in. Let me just stand and let Jordan see me. Yes. Even without the crutch, I can make some steps. You get it? I can make some steps. But I don't have to do it for uh, a long distance. Glory be to God first. And to the people he ha who he sent through his own divine arrangement, like Jordan and his colleagues, to come into my heart my life to offer all this assistance to me. God bless you all and better days ahead and wish you all well. 
that God himself will add his blessing and open great opportunities into your life. Amen and thank you, Jordan. I need a hug from you. <laughs> yes, Jordan. I thank you for coming into my life. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> my number one mission to be in Ghana is to promote and motivate other young people or for anybody for that matter to come out and help in different communities, uh, particularly third world communities like Ghana. I feel like they need the most help. With this being Jordan's third visit to Ghana, he's all too familiar with the country's state of public transportation. The Trusky, or Trotro, is how the locals travel short and long distances. Jordan stopped inside a healthcare store to purchase some medical supplies that he would later donate to some of the local clinics and hospitals. Along with the medical supplies, Jordan also bought a generator for the clinic in Aquada. I can stay here for three days and see more people die than I do in, at the hospital I work at in America in three months. It would have been better if this clinic should have been improved in more health system, like in terms of drugs, commodities, uh, in, to, to facilitate the delivery of health service in their community. Wisdom is a nurse at the only clinic in Aquara that deals with limited resources when it comes to delivering quality examinations to its patients. Most times, those hurt or sick are referred to a larger facility outside of the village. Wisdom has dealt with everything from emergency cases to OPD cases to pregnancies and even assistance with family planning. This especially hits home because due to the loss of his brother at a very young age, Wisdom discovered what his calling in life would be. We're eight in a family and I lost one of my brother and during his sickness he was sent to the hospital and it's like I was there as well and they did whatever they could but he wasn't able to come back to life so it really impressed me to be in the health sector. No particular event when it made me gravitate to nursing or going abroad. Um, my mother and grandmother were both nurses but we never talked about healthcare at all. Um, but I knew what they were doing. I knew that they came home happy and they loved what they were doing. Uh, I think it was just a calling for me. I like healthcare. I like the science behind it. Uh, I like helping people. Jordan's first healthcare job in the U.S. was an elderly nurse's aide. Cleaning them, transporting them, making sure they're all fed and everything. So it's a regular nursing aide job. I love to be a nurse by. A nurse with a difference, you know, a nurse with a difference, yeah. Because here I'm having, I have the chance to deal with the patient one-on-one. -on -one. In 2009, the WHO recorded 1.9 million cases of malaria. Many Ghanaians have developed a strong immunity against primary treatments, resulting in the use of more costly alternatives. Here you can see Wisdom administering a malaria test to a Takarati local named Gideon. Something Wisdom enjoys about working in the clinic as opposed to a hospital is that he has the opportunity to work closely with his patients. And that really impressed me or that really gave me the advantage against my colleagues who are in town who are not able to get one-on-one -on -one interaction with their clients. Here, when the client comes, you have one-on-one -on -one interaction. You know where the client stays, everything about the client any illness concerning the client, so it's like the client is in your hands. Stephanie is a nurse at F.A. Quante Regional Hospital, where Peter was treated after his horrific motor vehicle accident. Considering the hospital I'm working in, we see the medical ward have 16 beds for the female medical ward. As a regional hospital, it's too small. So most of the times, most of the patients come and then there is lack of bed to admit them on and then you have to let some of them be lying on the floor, sitting. An unconscious patient can even be sitting in a chair for almost 24 hours before we even get beds for them. So yeah, working, working here, most of the challenges are facilities, lack of facilities and then lack of space and then secondary lack of consumables for work. Due to the frequent hardships experienced at F.A. and Quanta, it leaves family members of those visiting the healthcare centers with no assurance in the services that are being provided. The relatives actually lose all their confidence and then their trust in the healthcare services. And they, so most of the time they prefer to go to the herbal centers and the spiritual places for health consults before 
the hospital is the last point of um, let me say the last point of uh, care to look for. It's impressive for me, I'll say, and I've I've got a chance to deal with a lot of sickness, a lot of illnesses, a lot of situations that my colleagues in the hospital are not able to have the chance. How is it being a nurse without electricity while you're taking care of the patients? That's risky. It's risky. It's life-threatening, you know. We need light and it's very important to have light to deal with cases, especially delivery cases. During Jordan's travels between the clinic in Aquata and hospital in Takarati, he discovered something was lacking. They didn't have an AED defibrillator, uh, mainly used for cardiac arrest and stroke and cardio problems that goes hand in hand. So if, if a hospital, a regional hospital doesn't have an AED defibrillator, how will they survive? Last year when I brought the AED defibrillator to FE Aquanta, I felt like it was very important for me to bring in that machine. According to research done in 2014, the top four killers in Ghana are strokes, pneumonia, cardiac arrest, and malaria. Two other major killers are HIV and hepatitis B. HIV and AIDS infections are considered low in Ghana as it relates to other parts of Africa. An estimated 260,000 people currently live with the disease, which is around 2% of the population. The deadly virus also accounts for 18,000 deaths each year, and 160,000 children have at least one, if not both, parents dealing with current symptoms. While in the village, a local came to visit the clinic with news that there was a sick family member in need of immediate medical attention. So later that evening, Jordan arranged for a Trotro driver to take him to pick up the patient and transport her to the nearest hospital. Jordan and Wisdom tested her early in the day, and unfortunately, she tested positive for both HIV and Hep B. Upon arriving to the hospital, the patient was loaded into a wheelchair, accompanied by concerned family members. They grabbed their belongings, rolled down the dark corridors of the lobby towards the main ward of the hospital. She had seemed to gain a little strength from being checked into the hospital, but Jordan received word two weeks later after returning to the States that she had passed away. So I, I, I would like to move to a better place where there are enough facilities to actually exhibit the knowledge that I have acquired. But if per, per by chance we get somebody to support the hospital and give us all, the, all those facilities that we need to work in that place. I would prefer to stay there. I will see but the future will be bright and I'm working hard towards it to ultimately to share and to learn more about the foreign ways of dealing with diseases and disease prevention as well. Yeah, to share ideas internationally. This is only one of five De Youngster International Schools ran by Anthony Kwame De Youngster throughout Ghana. When children report to classes in the morning, they briefly sing hymns that encourage learning. What basically inspired him is that he wanted to help the children in Ghana, honestly. And I believe for him, the best way to do that is through education. With ambitions of becoming the world's greatest engineer, De Youngster's dreams took a slightly different route. But unfortunately, with his background, um, his parents were really poor and they re weren't able to take him to school. But later on, he saw that he had a love for teaching and he used to teach children underneath, the, I think it was a mango tree. You have a few students come and all of a sudden the students start growing and growing and growing. It got to the point where people were like, you need to open up a school. So that's what he did. He opened up his first school. These are some of the photos from when the youngster was teaching at other schools prior to opening his very own. He actually made history at the first school he taught at by becoming the first male educator. For him, teaching was always in him. Education was always in him. Um, he wasn't able to go to college or higher like learning such as maybe like high school and things. But what he did is that he saved money. Not only to send his brothers and other siblings behind him to get an education, but he also saved funds that would contribute to the expansion of his schools throughout Ghana. So I think that's what really helped him start the schools. But I think it's also that he realized he has a gift. 
because he was unable to go to school like he wanted to, he is doing that for other children. He gives so many scholarships for children who can't go to school. SEM is the granddaughter of Anthony Kwame the youngster. So right now, I mean, my grandfather is definitely a man with vision, very hardworking, and um, still today at 80 years old, you can still see him at his desk, still working on school stuff. So that's my grandfather. She was born in Tallahassee, Florida, and although American, both of her parents are full Ghanaian. After graduating Florida A&M University with a bachelor's degree in broadcast journalism in 2014, she relocated to Ghana because she felt like it was a suitable time to reconnect with her roots. I believe the date was January 22, 2014 that I moved to Ghana. And the transition was um, quite interesting to say the least. Um, what my biggest obstacle was culture difference. I honestly thought that, okay, my parents are Ghanaians. I don't have to worry about it. Like, I know the Ghanaian culture. I, I didn't know the Ghanaian culture at all because I was born and raised in America. So, you know, it was a mixture of both cultures. But when I got here, um, some of the smallest things that I'm used to, um, I didn't have that here. And maybe the way I wear my clothes, I can't wear it here sometimes because it's not modest or the type of food that I eat, maybe my stomach wasn't used to it even though I used to eat some of it back home. This is the Ghana education structure. Preschool consists of children from ages 3 to 5. Basic and primary school are equivalent to elementary school with children ages 6 to 11. Junior high school is equivalent to middle school with children ages 12 to 14. Senior high school is equivalent to high school, which consists of children ages 15 through 17, followed by the institution equivalent of college and universities, which consists of children ages 18 to 21. The Ghana education structure has a striking resemblance to that of the United States. During during the time of the country's independence in 1957, Ghana had only one university and very few secondary and primary schools. So my grandfather had so many obstacles in his way to go to school. But one thing I really admire about him is that he kept pushing and that he didn't give up. And that now, today, he has five branches um, that help all these children in school. So many people say, oh, I've been through the youngsters. I mean, you can meet so many people who said, I went through there, I remember Mr. De Youngster. When he turned 80 years old, you should see the Facebook pages where people are like, oh my gosh, he's a great man. Thank you for all that he's done. So through his obstacles, he's made bridges for so many other people. The youngster's vision to establish in a strong school system didn't come easy. While still a young man living in his village, he wrote letters to both President Eisenhower and Kwame Nkrumah. There was a time when um, my grandfather was trying to go to school. His parents couldn't fund him to go. So he started writing letters out to America. Um, President Eisenhower, he wrote a letter to him. Both letters were written in 1957. The youngster's sole purpose in doing so was to figure out the best way to enhance his plans of making a better life for himself and his loved ones. The fact that Kwame Nkrumah actually wrote the youngster back filled his heart with tremendous joy, especially coming from the country's first prime minister. Mr. Nkrumah said, um, as much as you want to gain your knowledge and you want to come here and work, Accra is too expensive. So it's best that you stay in your village. Once enough money had been saved, the youngster relocated to Accra, where he still resides today, while still being involved with his passions of educating the youth. Ghana's official language of instruction as it pertains to textbooks and materials is English. Students have the option of learning in 11 different languages for the first three years of schooling. With the constant growth of America, this allows students to have an upper hand when faced with language barriers. This makes it easier to comprehend learning about other cultures and understanding foreign dialogues. Thanks to the continuous dedication by Anthony the Youngster, he's given children an opportunity at a quality education. If you can give a child um, knowledge, the child can take it anywhere they want to go and be able to blossom and grow. He was very proud of me. He told me, I see, if Kwame Nkrumah was here, these are the people that he would want to bring back to Ghana. These people who have um, lived abroad and who are dying to come back to their country to help build their country and make a change. So. He's very proud of me. He's proud of me that I'm still here two years later, and um, he can't wait to see what I'll do in the future. I did my last year of high school in, in, in Canada, in Hamilton, Canada. And um, yeah, I, I just directed for the first time when I directed a final school production 
And from there, I just, just went to the capital city, the Carlton University, where I started film school. Growing up with a real passion for filmmaking, Pascal Aka is thriving like he could have never imagined. You know, in this world, you're only going to find two kinds of people. Those who try to play God, and those who try to play Satan. I've been interested in filmmaking from as long as I can remember, I'm quite sure. Um, uh, growing up, like, watching movies on VHS was very, like, was, was, was more than a routine. It was like, you know, it was like food. Pascal is a Ghanaian actor, director, and filmmaker. His production company, Breakthrough Studios, has tackled a handful of productions in both Ghana and Canada. During his second year of film school, he wanted to start working on his very own projects instead of waiting until his fourth year. There's no way that this is going to be professional if I don't actually do, you know, going to school and just like, you know, reading about filmmaking without actual filmmaking, it's not going to get me anywhere. So while I was full time uh, in university, I did my first film, Jamie and Eddie's Souls of Strife. And uh, yeah, that's how I started and that's, 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 that's pretty much made me who I am today. Pascal was working on furthering his career in Canada until the unexpected happened. I came back here by accident, it was a, you know, a family member passed away and then uh, during the funeral period and everything, I decided to do like, okay, one music video, and, and more, more stuff happened, and then I felt like, you know, I was really, really welcome here. So I made, I didn't know what kind of impact I would make until I actually did it. Pascal was overwhelmed and shocked by the positive feedback that he received, but knew deep in his heart that returning home to Ghana was the best decision for him. Even though financially it may not be as rewarding as working in America or Canada, there still remains a huge potential for growth. Pascal believes that with time, there will be a huge demand for him as a director. If I go to Canada or California and stuff, I'll be one out of a million. But over here, I'll be one out of a few. Local television stations in Ghana are now competing with outlets like Netflix. There's so much potential in the, um, uh, in the African industry, in the entertainment industry, whether it's movies or music, you know, because a lot of people here, and it's like, if we appreciate our own, we can be a huge force to be reckoned with. Pascal says that if you're good at what you do, making a name for yourself shouldn't be that much of a challenge. Uh, Africa is very welcoming when it comes to the uh, entertainment industry, especially when it's good. Uh, but the advice I would give to anybody that wants to relocate here to make this a full-time job, my advice would be don't do it. You know, that's what the same advice I give to anybody that just want to be in filmmaking whatsoever. Uh, my advice is don't do it. And if what I say, what I just said, discourages you, then it really isn't for you because there'll be so many things that will discourage you from doing it. Pascal spoke of the constant financial disadvantages, the ongoing energy and fuel crisis, lack of clean water and electricity outages. This is a whole list of things completely separate from filmmaking, but something that may still pose a slight disadvantage depending on how much someone can endure. So many people, aspiring filmmakers, by the time that they, they, they get here, I mean, to be a more, much more financially rewarding industry, and the, and the audience would just get a lot more products out there that they can be proud of to Africans and you know, Africa's a diaspora and everything. If we all get together and really, um, really just pump up our market. I mean, there's just so much that, 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 that uh, we can do. One of the major projects under Breakthrough Studios was Ghana Police, a film that Pascal says he felt the international audience could watch and get familiar with, and at the same time, something the local audience would appreciate. Aside from music videos and short films, Pascal is most commonly known for doing feature-length action films, something that he's been able to showcase since returning home to Ghana. Interception is the second feature film that I directed. Um, uh, but overall, it's my, my fourth feature in my career. Two of them were done in Canada. Stay back. Even with the odds stacked against him, by making a transition from Canada to Ghana, Breakthrough Studios continues to thrive and make a name for itself. By the same time, um, it's not a rich country, but it's so rich. The whole continent is rich in culture. There's so many stories to tell. There's, uh, you know, um, there's a lot of territory that's not been touched yet. And if you just go out there and buy your land, figuratively speaking, um, it will appreciate in value uh, over time. I strongly believe in that. Whether through healthcare, education, or even film, it still remains true that being rooted in a higher calling can unite people from all walks of life. This is Ghana, West Africa.